Hello and welcome to the 11th installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to learn how to make a sprite move in various ways. This video will be broken down into the following segments. How do I make a sprite move? And how can I make the camera independently move? Following these segments will be an application demonstration. In this final part, we will be creating an elegant movement script. To introduce movement, we're going to have an NPC simply walk back and forth. So far, all I've done is lock the player. Type apply movement, then the hex value of the person event you're targeting, then a pointer to where the movements will be pulled from. Under the movement pointer section, type pound raw 0x12, pound raw 0x13, pound raw 0x13, pound raw 0x12, pound raw 0x0, then finally pound raw 0xfe. Each of these values tells the NPC how and where to move. These values vary across the Gen 3 games, so I'll post a link to them in the description of this video. I'll be using Fire Red for these examples, so in this case, these values will make the NPC step left, then right, then right, then left, and finally look down, in that order. Pound Raw 0xfe must be used at the end of your movement, or your game will freeze. After the apply movement command, type weight movement, then the hex value of the person event number you're targeting. This command will wait for the NPC to finish its movements before continuing the script. If we don't use this command, the script will not wait for the NPC to finish moving. This is different from most other commands like message box, since those are carried out one after the other and not simultaneously. You might be wondering why I chose to use the value 0x0 instead of 0x4 since my NPC has a person event number of 0x4. This is because the weight movement command is a little bit special in its functionality. Using the value 0x0 will wait for whatever movement was most recently called, no matter what the person event number is. Finally, the NPC will say, I've finished moving, then the script will officially end. Viewing the result in game, we first interact with the NPC which gets the motion flowing. The NPC walks left, then right, then right, then left, then looks down, then says I've finished moving, and then the player is released. Now let's try something a little more tricky. We're going to make two NPCs move together, then display a dialog message. The catch is that one NPC will move more tiles than the other. That is, one of the NPCs will take more time to finish its movement. I'll be using the person event numbers 0x4 and 0x5, 0x4 being the female and 0x5 being the male, as shown on screen. I've locked the player and inserted two separate apply movement commands one after the other. The first moves the female NPC while the second moves the male NPC. The female NPC will move four tiles downward while the male NPC will move two tiles downward. Now let's use the weight movement 0x0 command, display some dialogue, and test it out. As soon as we interact with the fence, which is where I inserted my script, both NPCs begin moving. However, the female NPC walks further down than the male NPC. Not only that, but the dialogue is displayed once the male finishes moving down instead of the female. This looks really messy. It would be ideal for the dialogue to show up after the female finishes moving since she has the longest distance to walk. We need to debug our script. As I've already mentioned, the weight movement command takes the targeted person event number for its parameter. I've used the value 0x0, which will always wait for the most recently called apply movement command to finish executing. This command would be the second apply movement, which is the one that moves the male NPC a shorter distance. So, once the male is finished walking his two tiles, the dialogue shows up even though the female is still moving. To fix this, we can do one of two things. Our first option is that we can switch the two apply movement commands. This way, the wait movement command delays the dialogue until the female finishes moving, which is what we want. Our second option is to exchange the 0x0 value with the value 0x4, which is the female's person event number. Either way will work. Viewing the result, it looks like everything is working as intended. Both NPCs finish their movements in their entirety, and then the dialogue is displayed. Next, we're going to focus on camera movement. This comes with a lot of nuances, so we'll have to be cautious while writing the next script. All this script will do is move the camera up two tiles, pause for a moment, then move back to its original position. During the short pause, the player will move a couple of tiles and then return to his or her original position. So far, I've only locked the player. 
Next, type special 0x113. The special command has a variety of uses from simulating an earthquake to activating the national decks. I'll post some of these special values in the description of this video. Special 0x113 will unhook, if you will, the camera from the player. When we walk around in game, the camera is always centered directly on the player to make sure that the player's field of view is consistent throughout. Unhooking the camera from the player will allow us to move it independently of the player. Next, type apply movement 0x7f at move camera up. This value 0x7f targets the camera instead of an NPC. I filled out the at move camera up pointer section so that the camera will move upward two tiles, then quit moving. I'll use the wait movement 0x0 command to make sure that the script execution halts until the apply movement command is finished. After that, type apply movement 0xff at move player. The value 0xff targets the player instead of an NPC. Don't forget the wait movement command. Finally, move the camera back to its original position, then type special 0x114. This will hook the camera back to the player once again. I've inserted the script into a script event so we don't have to physically interact with anything to activate it. Upon activation, the camera is unhooked from the player and shoved upward two tiles. After this, the player walks around independently. Finally, the camera centers itself and becomes dependent upon the player's sprite. Very cool indeed. That's everything I plan to discuss in this tutorial. Using the information we've learned, we will create a script in which an NPC walks out of the player's field of view, then disappears forever by utilizing a flag. The script being made on screen right now aims to walk an NPC just out of the player's field of view as to not waste any time in ending the event. After all, there's not much point in moving an NPC when it's not even being loaded onto our screen. At least not yet. There will be in the future, but let's just dismiss that idea for now. So how do we know how many tiles the NPC should walk to fully remove itself from the player's field of view? At any given moment, the player can see exactly 7 tiles to the left, 7 tiles to the right, 5.5 tiles upward, and 5.5 tiles downward. The screen is made up of a 7 by 5.5 tile rectangle. Therefore, if we want a sprite to walk off of the screen to the left or to the right, we need to make it move 8 tiles left or 8 tiles right of the vertical axis, or the player's Y position. If we want a sprite to walk off of the screen up or down, we need to make it move 6 tiles above or below the horizontal axis, or the player's X position. Maybe. Actually, it all really depends on the size of the NPC. If the NPC is 16 by 16 pixels, this 8 or 6 tile rule works well. If the NPC is 16 by 32 like most human characters are, you'll have to move the NPC downward 7 tiles instead of 6. But if you're having the NPC move upward, 6 tiles still works. This is because a 16 by 32 sprite's head intrudes onto the tile directly above where the NPC is standing. If you're moving a 32 by 32 sprite, you'll need to move the sprite even further in all directions. If you can think through it knowing that every tile is 16 by 16 pixels in size, it shouldn't be too difficult to figure out. If you can't think through it, go ahead and run a few quick tests to see what works and what doesn't. We're about at the end of creating this script. Everything that went into making this has been taught to you through this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the 12th installment of this series.